Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, class. Welcome to Miss Bree's Garden Time. Here we are today going to focus on the helpful and the harmful bugs in the garden. So if you could put in the comment section how you're doing today, pros and cons, the things that you've experienced thus far, and hopefully you get to start off this Monday feeling super good super energized, and super grateful. So let's start off with looking at some of the helpful bugs that appear in our garden. However, before we do that, <laughs> let's break down this whole garden concept. So what is a garden and what is its purpose? As you see in the pictures above and below, a garden is land that is used to grow vegetables, fruit, herbs, or flowers. A planned space, usually outdoors, set aside for the display, cultivation, or enjoyment of plants and other forms of nature. As you see, we have bolded other forms of nature because today we are going to be focusing on those other life forms that inhabit the garden. Ants. Now, I know we are all familiar with ants. However, ants, as this beautiful paragraph says, are farmers themselves. Having raised crops and livestock for millions of years, some species of ants herd crop pests like aphids, for instance. Ants offer indirect benefits like making and aerating soil. Aeration involves making small holes in the soil to allow air, water, and nutrients to penetrate the roots. This helps the roots grow deeply and produce a stronger crop. They can also fend off an array of more irksome insects. So that's what the ants are able to do. The ants are able to fend off more irksome insects. Research suggests certain ants control crop pests at least as effectively as pesticides. So these ants are able to effectively get rid of or deter these other pesky pests that tend to infiltrate the garden better than the chemical pesticides. In one study, cashew trees guarded by weaver ants had 49% higher had 49% higher yields than pesticide treated plants, which trees, which means that the pesticides weren't able to protect the tree as much as the ants did. And they also produced higher quality cashews bringing the, the people who are working the land, the farmers, a 71% higher net income. Ants have also been found to rival chemical pesticides, meaning they do better to protect the crops, such as mangoes, cacao, and citrus. So we've talked about the ants in the garden. Not a lot of people really like ants. You know, they crawl on us, me personally, in the garden. They're always crawling on my shoes and my hands when I'm digging deep in the garden. So I have a newfound appreciation for them and all that they do to, to keep our crops protected. What do we have next? Bats in the garden. Now, depending on the area in which your garden is set up in, you may or may not be engaging with bats. However, it's, it's super imperative or super important to know about the benefits of having them around. And we're gonna read them now. One little brown bat can eat hundreds of mosquito-sized flies in a single night. So as we are able to recognize, mosquito flies are not something we want in our garden. The little brown bats really are prolific predators of mosquitoes, meaning they're excellent predators. And that's not all. Aside from mosquitoes, insect-eating bats also eat many moths whose caterpillars directly threaten crops. 
just by eating corn earworm moths, for instance, bats save U.S. corn farmers roughly $1 billion a year. Wow. And like bees and butterflies, some fruit-eating bats are also brilliant pollinators. So just like we need bees and butterflies, we need our bats to pollinate our beautiful fruits and our beautiful flowers. Songbirds. Lots of songbirds prey on crop pests like caterpillars, beetles, snails, and slugs, especially when they have hungry mouths to feed in breeding season. Many offer tangible benefits to people, such as reducing leafhopper abundance by 50% in vineyards, which is definitely a pest in the garden, the leafhopper. Cutting caterpillar damage in half at apple orchards or saving coffee farmers up to $310 per hectare by eating borer beetles, to name a few. So these birds are really, really helping. And also ladybugs our beautiful, beautiful assistant as well. And we'll get into that. And here are our big, beautiful friends, the raptors, also known as birds of prey. Raptors, AKA birds of prey, include a variety of predators like falcons, hawks, and owls. Many species hunt the critters that aim to steal our crops. The key is identifying your pests. So knowing which critter is out there, knowing your local raptors and finding the best bird for the job. If rabbits eating your kale after dark, for example, you might want to attract nocturnal owls because those rabbits are going at nighttime. So you're gonna need a nocturnal bird or a bird that likes to hang out at nighttime to get those animals out of your garden. But if squirrels nab your tomatoes in broad daylight, the answer may be a falcon or a hawk. Some raptors are also better suited to certain environments. True, a family of barn owls can eat 3,000 rodents in one four-month breeding cycle. Wow, 3,000 rodents. They do prefer large properties with open space for hunting. That, that makes sense. You can set up a nest box for them as well. Okay. Now you're knowing and learning how to attract the bird. Dragonflies, frogs, and ladybugs. I know we get back to ladybugs. Dragonflies are expert aerial hunters, meaning they know how to fly through the sky. They nab prey from midair with a success rate as high as 95%. Wow. They are grabbing insects in the air, like mosquitoes, midgets, and gnats, at 95, that's 5% a chance that you're going to get away. Wow. They can make it much easier to spend quality time in your garden or, or other outdoor spaces during the summer. Okay, we need some dragonflies. Native amphibians. Frogs can be a blessing for farmers and gardeners. That includes frogs, toads, and salamanders, most of which are opportunistic insectivores. So whenever they have a chance to get that insect, they're going to get that insect by any means. And ladybugs, also known as lady beetles or lady bird beetles, are some of the most famously beneficial garden insects. They're beloved not just for their iconic appearance, those beautiful speckled dots on that red body, but also for preying on aphids, scale insects, leafhoppers, mites, and other crop pests. So not only are they gorgeous, but they also help us a lot. Yikes. Lastly, spiders. Miss Breeze is not a fan of the spiders. And we have so many spiders at RCP. Now let's see what the pros are of having them in our garden. What are the positives? Like bats and snakes, spiders are unfairly typecast as scary. Womp, womp, womp. Well, they rarely bite people. And even when they do, most bites are only minor nuisances. 
their venom is meant for much smaller prey, including insects that cause more trouble than any spider could ever cause. House spiders patrol our homes for pests like flies, mosquitoes, fleas, and roaches, and outdoor spiders can play even more valuable roles in farms and gardens. So we need these spiders. We got to be nice to our spiders. They're, they're actually helping us a lot. Make a, make a pack with me today. You will be nice to a spider. Don't, do not kill it. Just relocate it. Put it outside. Trap it with a cup. Aphids. These are the things that we do not want in our garden. These tiny pear-shaped critters have long antennas and two tubes projecting rearward from their abdomen to behind them. They usually hang out on most fruits and vegetables, flowers, ornamentals, and shade trees throughout North America. Aphids suck plant sap, causing foliage to distort and leaves to drop. So they're sucking out the energy and the good vibes out of our plants. Honeydew excreted on leaves supports sooty mold growth and feeding spreads viral diseases. Ew. We do not want aphids. Aphids, aphids. And here are a couple other beautiful, beautiful insects we do not want in our garden. On the left, we have cabbage maggots. Yuck. Caterpillars and cutworms. All of these insects are a gardener's worst nightmare. So let's watch a more in-depth look at these type of creatures that may try to inhabit our garden and how to see them, how to know that they are there. Some telltale signs. From the look of these shredded leaves, it appears that something has tried to turn these cabbages into coleslaw. Oh, this is a Hi, I'm the bug guy here for University of Maryland Extension. Insects and diseases are going to wreak havoc in your vegetable garden. Oftentimes when you arrive at the crime scene, the perpetrator is not going to be there. All you're going to have is the victim. But like a crime scene investigator, you can use the clues. These are the symptoms and signs that insects and diseases leave behind to identify the perp. Just as criminals have specific weapons of choice, Insects also leave characteristic damage behind, and the damage is caused by their mouth parts. There are fundamentally two types of mouth parts. The first is called a chewing mouth part. Insects like beetles and caterpillars have chewing mouth parts, and they leave behind a characteristic signature. The other type of mouth part is a beak, a sucking mouth part. As you might guess, when an aphid or a stink bug jams that into a plant, it's going to leave behind characteristic symptoms. There are five types of symptoms that insects cause when they damage plants. First, they can chew the leaves. They can also discolor the leaves. Their feeding can cause distortion. It can also cause dieback. And finally, as insects move about the world, they leave behind a variety of products. We'll look at these. These coarse holes in a squash leaf are a sure sign of an insect with chewing mouth parts. In this case, cucumber beetles fed on this leaf early in the season. It's going to wear this damage all season long. Smaller insects with chewing mouth parts cause a different kind of damage. Basically, they feed between the lines. This type of damage is called skeletonization, and it's caused by the Mexican bean beetle. 
Really small insect with tiny mouth parts make very small holes. Flea beetles create a type of damage called shot hole. It looks like somebody blasted this with a shotgun. This is clearly a case of double homicide, death by discoloration. You can see harlequin bugs have been feeding on this. They take their beaks, jam them in the plants, secrete proteolytic enzymes that cause these lesions. And look at these potatoes. Thousands of leaf hoppers have moved over here. They put their beaks in, they suck the juice out and cause discoloration called hopper burn. These two plants are in real trouble right now. Another type of insect damage is dastardly distortion. As you can see, early in the season, these bean leaves were big and beautiful, but leaf hoppers have moved in. They're taking their beaks. They're damaging those tender young leaves. These leaves are looking gnarly. They're not going to be able to photosynthesize. They're not going to be productive. Leaf hoppers, distortion. Sometimes we find a victim that's been dead a while. This little squash plant died from a bacterial wilt disease that was carried by a cucumber beetle earlier in the season. Whenever we see dieback, we know the vascular system has been damaged. Usually damage to the vascular system can be lethal. As insects move their way through the world, they leave stuff behind. Hey, they're just like us. Sometimes we can use these insect products to help us detect the presence of insects or mites on our plants. When caterpillars feed, they often leave behind silk. On these cucumber leaves, we can find the telltale signs of the silk of a little leaf-tying caterpillar that's going to defoliate these things. As insects feed, let's face it, they're going to leave behind stuff, excrement. We call this frass. If we look at these stalks of corn, we can see the frass that's being excreted and forced out of these stems by European corn borers. So we know there are corn borer larvae inside these stems. Another sign that's readily apparent are the eggs of insects. Here we see the eggs of the squash bug. These little bronze bombs are going to hatch. The nymphs are going to come out and feed, but we can detect those eggs, eliminate them, and this is going to reduce our problem down the road. So if you use the five symptoms, chewing damage, discoloration, distortion, dieback, and insect products, you'll nail the perp every time. Guess what, Mr. Harlequin Bug? You've just received the death sentence. Okay, so I love that, and I loved him. And I want to thank you guys so much for watching our video today. Make sure you tune in next week for more super, super cool videos with Miss Breeze. And today, if you need to, please write in the comment section anything that you'd be interested in learning about via garden, via life, being earth. Tap in with me. Helpful and harmful bugs in the garden. Peace.